Hi, uh, welcome to episode three, uh, Stuff and Nonsense, a place where you will find loads of stuff and a little bit of nonsense. Um, look, I'm Joe, the one that's not all Northern Irish. I'm Anella, the one that is. So Anella, <laughs> look, we were talking earlier, right, about mm-hmm. your record collection because you was a DJ, right? So uh, what did you find? Go on, I want to see some well, gems. <laughs> I was going through them because I actually got rid of a whole pile of them because I there's no point in them sitting here gathering dust and I don't play them. So I took out ones that I did want to keep. Uh, I got Toya, four from Toya. Um, Divine, you think you're a man? Which we'll talk about later, I think. Um, one of my favourites, I've got a lot of David Bowie here, wow. Phil Spector, The Crystals, some Motown stuff. I love this, An Emotional Fish. Do you know that song? No, I don't. Who sang no. that? Well, they're called An, an Emotional Fish. Oh. The song is Celebrate. <laughs> I, I used to sort of finish off my radio show with that song. And one of my other favourite bands is the a band called The Four of Us. From They're from Newry here in, in uh, Northern Ireland. And of course, I've got some Elvis, another boy track, loads of boy tracks here. One of my favourites, Rebel Rebel. Um, oh. And, and yeah. you've got the little disc in, missing in the middle. because Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. And I remember back, back. Yeah, back when I was a, a mod in the, in the early... 80s we used to share records so you'd lend them to people yeah. and people would sign the sleeves so they would all so i've got all these albums that have all these messages and stuff and, and people's signatures all around them it's kind of fun now well you inspired me to go and have a look in, uh-huh. in the loft and mm-hmm. uh, well i didn't realize how many i've got some old 78s up there as well but i couldn't even lift them down 78s so, 70 70 yeah, how 70 old are you <laughs> i know yeah yeah, just... yeah my mom has 78s anyway so but i thought my very first song that my first record, I should say, that I bought mm-hmm. was, um, don't laugh, but I thought it was Puppy Love. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> <ask> me, <right? laughs> and Nothing wrong I, with that. No, but when people have asked me, that's what I've said that I've bought, right? And <clears> now I wish I'd have spoken to my brother before because I um, don't speak to him that much, but he rang up the other day and said that I went into a record shop with him because mm-hmm. there was a song that I loved and to see if I can, it was uh, Ken Booth. Can you see that? Oh, I love Ken it's Booth. The, for all the, all the decades before, I've been telling everyone it was Donny Osmond and Puppy Life. <laughs> and know, it's actually, it. and you're actually cooler than that because you've got a Trojan, I know, everything that. I own. Well, it's funny because my first record I ever bought was Pass the Duchy by Musical Youth. So kind of, that must've been the same era, right? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, but anyway, look, we should get on to our next guest, right? Because I guess today I'm a little bit overexcited, right? Is the Duchess of the Dance Floor, right? And she uh-huh. provided Me? stock. <laughs> yes, you were the Duchess of the Dance Floor, not. Um, but, <laughs> but Hazel provided Stock Aiken and Waterman with their first top five hit. And for people that might not know who uh, they were, um, in the 80s, they were producers. Pete Waterman, Mike Stock and Matt Aitken. And they produced around 300 hits. So, Yeah, they used to churn out, they used to churn out hit after hit, do you remember? Yeah, yeah. Hayley, Rick Astley, Mel and Kim, yeah. Sonia, Jason Donovan, don't forget Jason Donovan. And uh, I don't think I had quite realised either until I was sort of researching this, is that Divine uh, was... You're, you think you're a man that was on their label as well yeah i didn't know no that. sorry it wasn't on their label it was it was produced by them yeah. it was on the proton label but i uh, love that song really love that song and and of course so one of their first successes from our guest who is none other than the queen of high nrg <laughs> <laughs> is hazel dean hazel. yeah i can't wait oh. i can't wait that she comes on high energy enough of that come on bell hurry up <laughs> There she is, there she is, let her in. Hi Hazel, welcome to our virtual home, the Stuff and Nonsense Zoom HQ. Stuff and Nonsense, that's a... (laughs) <laughs> well, it, it kind of is a lot of stuff, and, and then we there's always a load of nonsense with myself and Joe, so that's. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I'll come up with some as well. Oh, good, good. <laughs> I usually do. <laughs> so Hazel Dean, you're you're the queen of the dance clubs, right? And your voice mm-hmm. is the sound of the eighties, and you happen to actually be one of my top icons of that era. And recently, rightfully so, you got a nod from Russell T Davis uh, by playing the track "Whatever I Do." And and I have to say, wherever I go as well after that, on, on this groundbreaking <laughs> series, it's a sin. You're yeah. also the proud patron of Sorry Pride. 
Yeah. And we were, we were just talking earlier about the first records we ever bought. And mine, uh-huh. was, <laughs> mine was Pass the Duchy by Musical Youth and Joe's was Britney Spears' Hit Me Baby. <laughs> oh, God. You're going to ask me what mine was. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you remember? I do, yeah. It, <laughs> <laughs> it was. Is it that um, embarrassing? Well, it is a bit, yeah. Well, no, I love it. It was uh, The Carnival Is Over by The Seekers. Oh, right. Do you know that song? I do. Yes. Nice heart. Can you sing it for me? I uh, know. <laughs> I, I am a terrible singer. <laughs> the Carnival Is Over. La, 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 la. See, I like melodies even back then. Yeah. <laughs> Did that you cover that? Good. Did you ever do a cover of that one? Uh, no. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> that I didn't. <laughs> Oh, well, that's well, the pace did change as I went down the line, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. But look, I, I know you started playing some guitarist, so I know you started playing off uh, by playing the guitar, but mm. where did you realise that you had that voice? Um, the voice came a bit later, really, because um, I, I, I started to, I learned to play guitar um, when I was at school, when I was 11, 12 years old. Um, and and found that I had a natural sense of rhythm. See, do the movement there. That's uh... <laughs> and um, and uh, I used to be in a school band, and we used to do oh, a lot of stuff like um, all the, the shadows, all that kind of. There was a lead guitarist called Jeff, and I, I was the rhythm guitarist. And it all sort of started from there, really. But I never really started singing until probably I was about thirteen or fourteen, and I joined a sort of little more of a local dance band hmm. and we go around doing little gigs all over Essex and just sort of happened to ask me one day if I if I could sing basically so I said well I had sang you know I'd done some backing vocals in some of the bands and uh, well, I said well yeah I, I can sing so that's how it kind of started really just, just singing and I used to sing a lot of sort of jazz, more jazzy type songs obviously pop songs of the day um, but um, yeah, I, I found that's how I found out I had a singing voice. You know, I heard the other day that you, you were saying that you've been in the music industry for nearly fifty years. It's kind of hard to well, believe. Well, no, it's not fifty. It is fifty years. It's it 50, is 50. fifty years this year. Yeah. Um, but I, to be honest with you, I was in it beyond that, really, because the, I'm talking to you now about days when I was a semi-professional semi-profes- mm-hmm. when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually became professional when I was seventeen. So that's so, always been your life as a music industry? It's always been my life. To be honest with you, even before I learned to play the guitar, I was always so fascinated by, I loved the Beatles. Mm-hmm. I loved all those female singers, Dusty, Cilla Black. Oh, yeah. but I loved all, or I loved everything from the 60s. I loved all the bands as well, but, uh, you know, always been a big, huge Beatles fan. And um, I still am and always will be, really. Were you ever a fan of the, the local band Small Faces in, in Essex? Um, I did like the small faces. Yeah, yeah. I, I like most of the pop bands around yeah. that time. I loved all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, I loved they're, they're from your area. Yeah. yeah, they are. Yeah, oh no, I love it all. I love all that stuff. Yeah, because mm-hmm. yeah. you started like you've really sort of cutting tracks for Decca Records back in I think it was seventy five, wasn't it? So yeah, I, I um I met a guy called Paul Curtis, who I so sort of through the seventies I started joining bands, big bands. Um, Back in those days, we used to have the Mecca dance halls. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it was fantastic, really, because they were like, it was all live, you know, great big dance bands, smaller groups. We used to have the revolving stages. And um, so I, 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 was, I was singing in lots of different bands at the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and so, you know, that's where I, as I say, I, I trod the boards, you know, I learned, I learned my, my craft. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, I met a guy called Paul Curtis. I've been singing in bands for, for quite some time and I wanted to do something different. I was in like what they call residential. So I'd be singing in. I used to work at the Cat's Whiskers in Streatham um, and various dance halls, actually around the country, I suppose. Um, but I decided I wanted to do something different. So I joined this band that worked on the road, travelled. No, I was just going to say, I just as you mentioned that, I've been a big Northern Soul fan and I, I can really hear the influence of Northern Soul and some of that high energy. And you work well, with Ian yeah, Levine. I do have a link with Northern Soul, funny Yeah. Enough. So I met this chap and I joined his band. And Paul Curtis is a, um, he used to write to do a lot of stuff for, uh, he used to write a lot of Eurovision songs, actually, song really? for Europe. Right? Yeah. And um, he was a singer-songwriter. Mm-hmm. And um, 
anyway, he loved my voice. I sang in his band. I left that band after a while because I actually didn't particularly enjoy what I was doing, so I left. Right. Um, but we kept in contact. And through him, I started doing working with him in a studio. So about a little bit before mid-70s, probably just 70, 74 maybe, mm -hmm. I... Um, I started working in a studio, so that's the first time I would hear my voice in a studio mm -hmm. recording. Right. And, well, I loved what I heard. I, I thought it really sounds great. You know, it's funny when you hear, you know, when you hear your voice the first time back in a studio, it's really weird because you're so used to singing live all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so through Paul, I, uh, I, that's through Paul, I got the Decca record um, uh, deal. Uh, we, we recorded some tracks and funny enough I did sing a song in 1976 I sang in the Song for Europe. That's when Brotherhood of Man won it with Save Your right. Kisses. But I was in Song for Europe uh, with a big ballad. Uh -huh. And uh, But we recorded a couple of tracks that um, we did a version very sort of a la Gloria Gaynor, um, never can say goodbye sort of type of sound. Mm -hmm. um, with live orchestra. I mean, oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but unbeknown to me, I, I did a track called Our Day Will Come. Which I is love a, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also sang a song which Paul wrote called Gotcha Where I Want Cha, Babe. I was going to mention and, both of those. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, um, they were huge Northern Soul classics, and I didn't know that. Right. And because of that, it's kind of because of that, I like, actually, further down the line in the 80s, I sang Searching. Mm -hmm. Because Ian Anthony Stevens, who wrote and produced Searching, used to be... He's northern, and he used to be on that scene, and he and he knew my voice. Mm -hmm. And so, it's funny how those things link up. I was going to ask, how did Ian Levine come into all of this? Because he didn't you work well, with him on some? I did work with Ian. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Ian Levine did the ver his very first remix was on Searching. Mm -hmm. So is that is that how did he change or affect your sound in any way? Not Ian, no, not really. Not Ian. Mm -hmm. um, he just did what Ian does. Right. Um, but I also did a lot of writing with Ian in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And he did do a one or two remixes. So I've, I've and I, I have sang a couple of these songs on, on um, You're My Rainbow is an Ian Levine um, song. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've sort of, um, I've worked with him quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that they're, they're all the sort of, obviously in between all those times, I did session singing, I, I did all sorts of stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah. That's, that's really interesting because I even yeah. think even that Northern Soul sound that you had and, and Pete Waterman of course was a Northern Soul DJ and of you can really yeah. hear that influence in some of his. Yeah. Well yeah. you know if you can and of course it's got that and the Tamla Motown it's, yeah. it's, it, it's all sort of linked in a way isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially like you sang about searching, obviously, with Ian Levine. I mean, and then that was a huge hit in the gay clubs, not just UK oh, yeah. as well. It was like obviously in the, in Europe as well. All over the world. Yeah. Before it went kind of mainstream as well, sort of like a, a year after, you know. So, and you went flying as well with, I have to say, whatever I do, wherever I go, I have to say the whole title. Or is it yeah. just right? <laughs> but that was the first top five hit as well, first stock aching and stock aching. They yeah. must have loved you for that. So, what was it like working with those guys in the early days? Oh, in the early days, it was lots of fun. I mean, um, I, uh, I actually uh, met Pete Waterman before I worked with him because um, that searching was out. It was number six in the charts. I've got to get it the right way around. <laughs> um, but I bumped into Pete. Um, no, it was before Search became a hit um, because I actually got one of my own songs. Um, I had a song uh, in the last eight for Song for Europe back in 1984. Bef before I, before Searching became a hit, it was like the early part of the year, because you, you know what's going to go into the last eight, sort of probably in January, February. No, actually, you know it before Christmas, so you have to get your song prepared. Mm -hmm. So I got my song in the last eight mm -hmm. for Song for Europe, 1984. Sunita was in that year as well, singing a song, funnily enough. Um, that's when I met Pete Waterman because Barry Evangelis, who used to run Proto Records, he put me together with Pete because Pete, that's what Pete used to do. He had a, 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 a company called Loose End Productions and he used to put people together, producers, singers. So he put me together with this, this producer and, um, and it was a ballad. And, I, and in 1984, I actually sang in the song for Europe again with one of my own songs. <laughs> it didn't win, but the decision we had made is Searchin had been out in the clubs through 83 and I'd been working all the clubs and going to America, blah, blah, blah. And we said, if we don't win this song for Europe, we'll re-release Searching. 
1984, I didn't win Song for Europe. And so we re-released Searching and, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Thank mm-hmm. goodness you didn't win then. That's right. Yeah. Well, in a way, yeah. I was, I was, I was a bit, I wasn't very happy at the time, I can tell you. <laughs> and I said, just... never, never again. <laughs> Doing, and, oh, in, doing. in those in those days of the the, the hit factory and and as they were churning out those hits did you see other other artists in the corridors was it that busy yeah sometimes i did but um, i mean it, to me the, the best times were the early days mm-hmm. you know because after after searching had been a hit i bumped into uh, again at proto records i bumped into pete waterman and and um, they were doing some stuff for uh, some other tracks for proto records Mm-hmm. And sit, Surgeon was sitting at number six in the charts, and I hadn't got follow up. Right. So he said, "Well, what what are you doing then? Oh, what's happening, kid?" It's, he, you know, it's called everyone kid. <laughs> He's not that much older than me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, I said, "Well, it's it's, it's a bit tricky, really, Pete, because you know, I'm, there I am. It's lovely. I'm sitting at number six. I said, but I don't have a follow up." And he he literally said to me, "You must come and meet these two guys I'm working with. These two new guys." Um, we're doing a we're doing some tracks down at the Marquee Studio. So he said, come meet them. So off I trot to the Marquee Studio. There's Mike and Matt sitting there. And, and the track I hear, because the Marquee Studio at that time was like, you know, it was a fantastic studio. The sound was just superb. Mm-hmm. And um, I heard the backing track to uh, You Think You're a Man, Divine. Hold that. And hold that thought. Oh, <laughs> well, do you know we were we were going through our records. They were talking about going through our records, and I I came across that. And I oh, knew, how funny! Yeah, I knew yeah. I had it, and I loved. I used to play because I DJ in London. Yeah, well, that's the track I heard in the yeah. studio. Track yeah, track. That's a great track. I went, oh my god, this is fantastic. This is perfect. Mm-hmm. And then we we came up with uh, whatever I do, wherever I go, and again, it just well, it, it was their top five, first top five single. Yeah. Oh, you know, it was it was fantastic. So you've you've toured quite a lot, and you've like you've had success all over the world from yeah Europe, South Africa, the US, Australia, and beyond. Um, I even remember seeing a poster for you when I was in Corfu in the eighties on a holiday. <laughs> Did you have a favorite place you like to perform? A favorite city in the US? Or... Um, I I used to. I mean, I I people ask me my favorite club. It's not really the club itself; it's the people in it. Huh. So I mean. Most places they are fantastic. You know, you have good, you have bad, but nine times out of ten, fantastic time. And those those early days were brilliant. Um, I used to love going to America. Mm-hmm. I went to America first in 1983 to promote Searching mm-hmm. and another track called Evergreen that I had out at the time. Yep. And I I used to go to America every year from 1983 onwards to I think my last sort of tour there was probably 91, but like for 11 years. Um, I used to go every year for about a month or so and, and tour. I mean, it was hard work, but yeah, I used to fly everywhere. But we mm. used to, uh, we always used to finish up in uh, Florida. Mm-hmm. And I, there were two clubs. There was one in Fort Lauderdale and one down in Key West. And they they, they were called the Copa. Right. They owned by the same company. So we always used to finish up down there and uh, do the Copa, Fort Lauderdale, and then go down to Key West. And I used to spend a week or so. Oh, God, I used to love it. Did you I, just I chill? That. Just yeah, just you know, and yeah, but I love the whole thing. I, uh, America, you know, if it's all going great in America, it's lovely because you get to the airport and there's a great big limousine waiting. It's all over the top, you know, mm-hmm. champagne in the back. But I just used to, <laughs> I used to love all that. You know, I used well, to. Yeah. I do no, did you ever, do you ever do ever make it up to Maine where I live? <laughs> the um, up in north of Boston. I did once. I did do a, a place in Maine. Don't yeah, ask me. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Portland. But I did do something up there, yeah. Because I and I did do a few. I did. I used to go to Boston as well. I used to sort of go all over the place. But yeah, I do yeah. only once, and it was in the very early days of searching. I remember going to Maine. So yes, yeah. so yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were great times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. talking of that, I mean, one of my one place I always wish that I would have gone was uh, like Studio Fifty Four. <clears throat> you even oh, I did Studio Fifty Four. Yeah, I did. Like yeah, that? yeah, it was weird because. Yeah. Um, I wasn't actually, but I've got a funny story about that one, actually, because I'd already done a show that evening, an earlier show in Brooklyn, and I'd gone back to my hotel room and I was all, I was in, I was in bed and I'd taken all the makeup off a <laughs> bit and there was a knock at the door and it was some hideous time in the morning and um, 
it was my manager at the time saying, Hazel, um, how do you feel about doing Studio 54? <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, this is a strange time. When? Now. <laughs> um, yeah, because Michael Brown, do you remember Michael Brown? Do you, know, do, you, do you know an artist called, well, Michael Brown had a big, big record called So Many Men, So Little Time. Oh, oh I, uh, that name rings a bell, yes. Well, well Sunita did a version of it a few couple of years ago. That's probably yeah. So, uh, Michael had a huge, huge club hit with it. Mm -hmm. it. The only reason it wasn't really a hit is be be because of the lyrics, that Radio 1 wouldn't play it. Right. And it was always a little bit of a rival record with Searching as well at the time. But Michael had uh, Michael was ill, so she couldn't do this show this particular night. And uh, so that's how I ended up. I had to get up, do the whole thing, get the makeup on and put the <laughs> clothes on. And off I trot. I mean, it's some, you know, it's about three o'clock in the morning. And uh, I mean, it was <laughs> packed. And I, my show was on, a, I had to sort of go up this, I was on like a, a, a cage thing. Um, and it sort of what, it ran the length of the stage, but it was, I was looking down on people. I mean, it's totally over the top, but it was fun. <laughs> They, they did let you out, all right. There wasn't locked in. But eventually, yeah, right, yeah. 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 <laughs> is, is there video footage of that? I'd love to see that. <laughs> Funny, but yeah, that so that was my experience with Studio Fifty Four. But yeah, so from from Studio Fifty Four to Top of the Pops. Mm. So anyone watching this on YouTube or listening on the podcast that's over the age of forty will remember fondly the BBC Top Forty, where we all tuned in religiously to watch. Top of the Pops. What was it like to be on that show back then? Was yeah, it... It, it was, I mean, obviously it was great to get it because you knew that your uh, record was going up the charts. You knew it, that you were going to go into, I mean, when I first did Searching, I'd literally just crept into the uh, top 40, mm -hmm. but you knew you were going up. And if you get Top of the Pops, that's, it was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. But it, it, my experience of Top of the Pops was everybody was, because they knew what the show was all about, it was so important to do that show. Mm -hmm. um, everyone would, um, and I mean, to, you, you kind of would go off to your dressing room and, and just sort of, I mean, I know some people would hit the bar probably and stuff, but um, I, I was one of the ones that just, I wanted to uh, sort of just compose myself all the time because I knew how important this show was. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you, you did see people in the corridors and things, but everyone was so sort of concentrating on what they were going to do. And, and uh, so it was, it was a bit like that, but it, but it was great to do. I loved it. And then once you get on there and do it, it's it's fabulous. Isn't it? Yeah, there was mm -hmm. a lot of miming as well back then, wasn't there? And well, it's not miming. It, it's called lip syncing. Oh, you, okay. you, if you watch Drag Race, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah Start Joe on Drag Race. You know, you know, people say about the, the miming or whatever you want yeah. to say, but you know, lip syncing has its own. It's, it's quite an art form in its own way. Uh, yeah. And because I would lip sync. Yeah. But I'm still singing. I'm still belting it out. Mm. But sometimes, I, see, I was a person that used to think, actually, I don't mind this because sometimes the sound on on a show, and the BBC used to be really not so good with sound sometimes. Mm. Sometimes the sound is bloody, oh, excuse me, is awful. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, and I, I actually hadn't, I didn't have any problem with it at all. Mm. And I, I'm good at, I was good at lip syncing. So. <laughs> And like you say, it is uh, an art. Definitely. You still got to rehearse it. Yeah. You, you've got to get it spot on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and so uh, it's uh, not as, been, as easy as you think. On that note, as well, of the performance, uh, Top of the Pops, I was revisiting some of the footage on of Top of the Pops and noticed that you have some pretty decent dance moves. Did you <laughs> did you have a choreographer or, or were you left to your own device? Oh, no, they were all my own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, oh, I don't know. I've never been told that before. Um, <laughs> No, I just sort of used to go with the just the trend of dancing at the time without going too much over the top. Yeah. I'm very much into the hand movement yeah, type, love. and I use them a lot these days. I can't I can't move around as fast as I used to, so I'm very into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for that. That's <laughs> yeah. But um, like, and, and in 2012, uh, I, I've heard you say it so many times before. So it's one of your favourite gigs at the O2 with the hit. Oh yeah. We used to play with Sunita and Kylie and not forgetting Matt and Pick as uh, Matt and, <laughs> no, <laughs> Mick Matt and Pick Pat. Pick. Well, I've forgot them already because I can't even Pat say their Mick. names. You Pat mean Mick. Let's all chant. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, great. And uh, oh, yeah, I mean, that that was such a great night. It was so well, it was just so nice to see everybody and everyone was relaxed, you know, the, um, and steps were there. Mm -hmm. um, Ronnie Gordon was there. Uh, it was fantastic. 
um yeah that was that was the best night one of the best nights and and and, um, and also it's just great to to do the the o2 as well the arena it's great and it wasn't just, you know, the other artists. It was all the people that used to work at PWR, people I haven't seen for years. Right. And we had a big party afterwards. It, it was lovely. It was a great evening. It was, was really it like good. a sort of family environment? Was it? It was, was, yeah. Well, it was always a bit like that. Yeah. yeah. No, it, honestly, it was the best night ever. It, I really enjoyed that night. It was fantastic. Like, like, it's a sin, right? So recently, rightfully so, as I've said earlier, you got a nod from Russell T. Davis and they yeah. played one of your tracks, uh, Lives of a Group of Gay Men uh, and Their Friends um, during the HIV and AIDS crisis in the UK. How did you find out that you was going to have one of your tracks in the massive hit for Channel 4 and HBO for the American listeners? Well, I, I had, um, I, they actually got in contact with us um, last year, in fact, and said, um, uh, I think it was Warner Brothers, because all all this EMI stuff now it's all it's all with Warner Brothers, and um, and they approached me about you know they'd like to use the song on the show. So um, I said, oh, absolutely, definitely, yeah. So that's you know, so I knew over a year before it actually came out that they were going to use the track. But they really got it because you know that there were you and, and some others that were going to the gig still like early hours in the morning. And it must have been strange seeing like less of a, an audience of your fan base. It's, it's got to be, it must have been really difficult. For yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was, um, I mean, the first, I mean, obviously I, I had heard, you know, talk of, of, of AIDS, but didn't, didn't really register um, in the very early days. Um, but it was 1984, I think. And I, I always remember it was a, how, when it first hit me, and, re- and I realised, oh my God, this is this is this is really bad. Um, I used to do a, a club in Brighton. I think I think it was called the Pink Elephant. And um, and uh, I'd been doing it since the early days, ever since searching really back in 1983 when it was you know still a club hit. And uh, fantastic place. And uh, and um, I always remember there was a to get into the club. You you come in and you'd hear the music thumping away and I used to arrive about an hour before I'd go on to the performance and I'm walking down you have to walk down the staircase to, to the actual room now I could hear all the music thumping away and I, I walked down the, the I walked down the staircase thinking oh, oh we'll have to you know get through the crowd to get to back to the backstage and, and I, I walked into the room and, and it was I mean there are a few people there but basically it was more or less empty and it was like yeah it was unbelievable I, I, I thought at first, I thought, oh, my God, perhaps they don't know I'm on tonight or, or something like that, you know. Um, but then, obviously, chatting to various people, and it, and it was it was because people were frightened to go out because of the AIDS virus. Mm-hmm. And that was my first sort of encounter with it, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but I think that's why, you know, the community, um, even generations after that, you know, are, are still loyal to you because you was always loyal to them. It means a lot. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I mean, th- that happened. And uh, I, I, it, it wasn't, I think once people knew that you couldn't get it by touching someone, once they were people, and myself included, once you became a little bit more educated about it, then you realise, you know, as long as you're sa- you keep safe, like we do now, mm-hmm. um, you, you're going to be fine. And, and and it was uh, the other person that he mentioned was uh, was a uh, was Kelly Marie, mm. uh, um, and we we just car- we carried on, but a lot of people didn't. They wouldn't go into the clubs. They wouldn't do the shows, and and um, and I carried on. Yeah. And and, and uh, because you know when I was promoting searching, they were everyone. I mean, the first club I ever did for searching was Heaven, and and it was like. I felt like a goddess walking onto that stage when I sang Search in the first time. And, and th- there was always this, it was almost like a love affair in a way, you know, it, 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 there was such great feeling and, and love. And, and um, I, I, I wasn't going to throw all that away, you know, not just because I knew that I, w- I was safe. Mm-hmm. And you know, no, it was horrible. And, yeah. and, and, you know, and you would see, sorry. I was just going to say, even back then, there was so much misinformation about about it that was going around yeah well yeah we, even you yeah. can see that and when you're watching it's a sin you, you know they really touch on that as well with yeah that. but i think they uh on it's a sin I, I think they really captured you know the, the feel the whole feel of the time i mean it, it it made me feel like especially in the in the pub they were in and 
and I used to do lots of pubs and, and, and uh, you know, you, you really did get that feeling of, of, of the 80s. You really, did, you really did get that feel for it. It was, it was so well done. It really was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I saw things in that. I mean, I, I mean, I did go to hospitals. I did, I did go, I did one Christmas. I did, we, um, it was me and, and, um, and Lee John and, and a few others. And we, we did it and it was, it was heartbreaking. Absolutely mm. heartbreaking. Is this in London? London? Yeah, I, I did. I went to the Westminster Hospital. I can't remember the other <clears> hospital <throat> I did, but I, I think we went to three or four hospitals and, and I just came mm. home. Obviously, it was so upset. It is. Yeah. Awful. Awful. But yeah. in that, um, in that show, in that series, in that uh, show, um, uh, it's a sin. I didn't realise that that um, how awful it was for them in the very early days when that when that you know when that poor guy Colin was put into that awful room and they locked him in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh God, that was that. You know, I had no idea. Me, me neither. No, I was really shocked. Yeah, I mean, mm. it's a, it was a very hard watch, but I do say to everyone, you must watch it because yeah, I think it, definitely, yeah. As you say, Hazel, it really captured that time. I mean, I started going to the clubs a, a, a little bit later in the eighties, but it was still it was still affecting people. People were still oh, it becoming, was oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. oh, and for it, sure, yeah, yeah. And st people still hadn't educated themselves enough as well, or still hadn't got the the correct information through back then as well. You know, no, no, you're I mean, right. I, I feel terrible with that, but I can remember every time I went into a gay bar, I'd be cleaning the glasses while I was drinking a pint, and that that's terrible, you know, and um. Yeah, yeah, but I, it's that it was that kind of feel still for quite yeah. a few years after that, Hazel. So you being there in the early days, and especially which I didn't know, you going to the hospitals and stuff. It's uh, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Very valued, yeah. Yeah, so, and I did I did lots of um, you know uh, uh, I did loads of little sort of events, you know, charities and things to, to raising money and all. And for Terence Higgins was the first one, so mm -hmm. I did quite. A, so over the years, I did quite a lot of stuff. For um, you know, for Terence Higgins and various um, charities at the time. Going back to the sort of Pride, uh, you're you're quite an esteemed member of the Pride Power List. And for those that haven't heard that title before, it's the definitive guide to the 100 most influential people in the LGBTQ plus community who are dedicated towards true equality and inclusion. You're also very involved in Pride events, as we talked earlier. You're connected with Surrey Pride. How did, how did all that come about? Um, well, I, I have actually been singing at Pride now for um, 38 years yeah. this year. Um, I actually, in 2019, I did, I did get a, um, an award, a gay, a gay icon award and with, that I was given to at my last Pride. I did that the year in, in Chester. Mm -hmm. I did Chester Pride and, and I got that award there. So Congratulations. Really, yeah, yeah, thank you. I was really happy with that. Yeah. And, uh, and then Surrey Pride, um, Stephen asked me, I, had I been to an event? Yeah, I did um, an event for them. Like, oh, God, no, it would have been Christmas of 2019. And um, they had a winter pride, and um, and I did the winter pride from a uh, theatre in Woking, mm -hmm. and um, and then after that, um, that's what they are. They asked me if I would be um, uh, their patron, and then I um, and, and before we went into lockdown in February last year, I mean, I, <laughs> which I, something I'm, I, I have real problem because I am dyslexic. Um, I did actually make a speech, um, so that that was. You know, I was very nervous about that. So, um, but uh, anyway, I, I, re I rehearsed it and rehearsed it. I had it all written down. So, um, yeah, I, th I think I delivered it okay. So, and that, so that was the start of that. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was all sort of looking good. And, and then we went into lockdown. <laughs> um, I, well, I have, we have been doing, I've done quite a few bits and bobs for them over, over, over the year, you know, mm -hmm. uh, doing like we did, we've done some radio things and various bits and things, bobs. Mm -hmm. I saw them off when they, when it was Gay Pride last year, they, they actually got a um, couple of vans and they, uh, they went round to all the different sort of places in, uh, in Surrey, all the different towns. It was really good. Yeah. Stephen and Bang are, are lovely. And I, I went up to, um, I got up at some awful hour in the morning where we <laughs> went into Kingston to wave them off. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I do various things and we keep in contact. So, um, yeah, so the last one we did is is this, um, that, was, that was the last little thing we did. Yeah, we definitely them. wanted to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, so we keep doing bits and bobs, you know, the best, mm. we do what we can. 
Yeah. Because mm-hmm. actually, I saw Rick Astley on. Because uh, obviously, I follow him as well on Twitter. <laughs> obviously, right? Yes. <laughs> well, we live in the same village, you know. Oh, you live in the same village. <laughs> oh. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, we live just up the road. He had one of these in his window. I walked awesome. up and put it through his door. <laughs> yeah. well, Do you see I... him at the supermarket? <laughs> <laughs> um, Tesco's. <laughs> Funny enough, we do have a little Tesco's here, but I haven't seen it. But Becky has, who you spoke to earlier. She she's but she bumps into him quite a bit. But yeah, on the on the odd occasion, yeah. I had I did bump into him one morning when I was walking the dog. But uh, no, Rick's lovely. He's, he's a really lovely guy. He's really yeah. sweet. And it's yeah. great to see him supporting it. But he didn't get because you've actually been signing them as well, haven't you? I signed stickers. the back for hundred, I think hundred and fifty. Yeah. And I know yeah. you're not recouping any of the costs, and all, so 100% of all the profits of everything is is going to to um, yeah. riding. Sorry, um, yeah. Well, it's so, not great fortunes, but it's just something you can do, yeah. you know. So where can we get one? Because did Rick nick the last one or what? So. Um, <laughs> you can you can get them from um, from Sorry Pride. Okay. Yeah. So, of course, prides, festivals, gigs all been cancelled lately yeah. and we're now looking back to a year of lockdown no. with this covid pandemic yeah. how has that been for you have you been able to just to spend more time with family or focus on yeah them? i mean the last two shows i had were just before lockdown funnily enough i had i, I even remember the dates it was the 6th and the 7th of march mm-hmm. of last year yeah and um well you know i find the best way to sort of get through it is is I keep to a routine more or less, mm-hmm. especially in my weekdays. Weekends, I will chill out a bit more, but weekdays get up quite early because we have a daughter. She has to go to school. I take her to school because so she doesn't have to go on the bus. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, she, but maybe she's been fantastic because she has been, you know, she's been um, at home and, and doing stuff at home. She's does her GCSEs this year. But, I mean, obviously, I'm not working. Um, I, obviously, I have to keep my voice in trim as best I can. In fact, I did go out because I don't have a sound system at home or I didn't. I went out and bought a little thing called a singing machine. Right. It's a bit like a karaoke, really, but I've got a little sound. I've got, well, I've actually got quite a big sound system, but I incorporate that in with my sound system so I can, you know, I have a, a live microphone so I, I, I can rehearse the show and, and do a bit of singing. So are your neighbours getting a little Hazel Dean rehearsal? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I lock down all the doors. <laughs> I have to, well, sometimes when people walk by out the front of the house, I, I, if I'm in there, it's in the other room. Um, I can see that they obviously can hear the thump of the bass drum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you say, oh, hello? <laughs> <laughs> and they walk by, and I can hear them going like this. I can see them going like that. You know. <laughs> you should put a stand outside with your CDs on as well, so you know you could stand up while you're doing this. It's like a live gig. Uh, no, no live I don't gig. think no, so. No, that no. is very tacky. No, it is. <laughs> Joe, uh, it's me. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> If it was one thinking, of she's me. a proper Essex girl. I yeah. <laughs> Any way of earning a buck, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be wheeling out the lemonade as well, so they could have refreshments halfway yeah. through. Yes. <laughs> no, I don't go that far. Is, is there any gigs or exciting plans that that you've got pre-booked that that well, you I've can go got buy a ticket for? Yeah, I've got. I've got. Um, my, my, well, hopefully, my first shows are, are meant to be the end of June. And one is is a was one is a no one is a let's rock because I'm doing let's rock again this year which is in in Leeds mm-hmm. and I think I've got one the night before but I'm not 100 percent sure yet in Kettering I think that's a little festival as well but I, I um I, I I don't that only came in last week so I don't think I've signed contracts but yeah I've got I've got some let's rocks in a, a few prides so um, Wentworth uh, I'm doing that later on in the year so I have got some things in but yeah. whether I do them or not is yeah. Yeah, I've even I've even got a show for New Year's Eve. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, where are you doing New Year's Eve then? It's a pub in Greenwich. <gasps> okay. The Georgian Dragon. It's great. It's, oh yeah, it's... I know the Georgian Dragon. Yeah, oh, uh, the Duchess runs it. We're we're old friends. Oh. So uh, so we're hoping because the biggest thing for me is I'm really nervous about singing indoors. I'm I'm, I'm kind of can deal with the festivals. I think so. I'm hoping I'm hoping I can do them. Yeah. Have you done any virtual? stuff streaming I, I, the only thing i did well i've done lots of interviews I, now i've done loads of things you know for prides and, and chats i did a silly thing on, on my facebook called at home with hazel right that was quite funny stevie mm-hmm. did it with me sometimes that, that that was fun i've done lots of things like that the mm-hmm. only thing i did was for let's rock right 
they, they, they wanted something and, and that's the only thing. But I knew, I'm, I'm really funny about singing at home and, and mm. I'm really fussy about sound and everything. And then, like I said to you guys, I don't have a sound system, whereas some people do. They haven't set up at home. I don't. So lastly, Hazel, I, is there one fact about you that we may not know? Putting you on the spot here, is there something you'd like to share? Maybe not, but if there's something you'd like no, to share that I you think, think that we... No, no, not really. I think so. No. Okay. Well, so I've got. There's one thing I can obviously see at the background is your Easter display. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been fancy yeah. Cadbury's eggs since I've seen. So, so, <laughs> there is a fact. Yeah, uh, Steve. They go mental. Christmas. You should see it that at Christmas. I just go out. Usually, I go out working, and then then when I'm when I come back, Christmas has arrived. <laughs> I don't have anything to do with these displays. <laughs> <laughs> It's just I love the little stuff. flower wreath There's as well. Stuff everywhere. Yeah, look. Little <laughs> figurines. Are they little rabbit figurines? Oh, yeah, little rabbits. Mm -hmm. All sorts of rabbits and all the Easter eggs. It's everywhere. I mean, I'm actually, I'm in the kitchen. The tell, me, are... tell me the rabbits aren't chocolate, are they? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, yeah, and otherwise I'd be eating the ears off that. They've got little oh, bones on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not chocolate. <laughs> but there will be chocolate. Yeah. Are you, are you a chocolate fan? I'll eat a little bit of chocolate. I don't eat much. Yeah. No, I do like I do like a nibble. Yeah. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> well, too much, especially when I come back here because American chocolate is terrible. But uh, yeah, it is. When it? I come back here, I just go mad for a week. Well, yeah. when I when I used to come back from America when I used to do my tours, yeah, I'll tell you something about me. I used to do the first thing I would do and eat. Because mm -hmm. I always used to get the the plane used to um, I used to arrive here early in the morning and the first thing I would eat was with beans on toast. <laughs> <laughs> well, beans over there are just full of tea. Uh -huh. Their tea is awful as well. So and their uh, beans, their beans are awful. Yeah, beans on toast and a nice cup of tea. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we've reached the quick fire round of this episode. Oh, this, this is, is going to tell. It's going to tell us a little bit more about Hazel Dean, yeah. I think. Actually, oh. it's a very easy start. Very easy start. Tea or coffee? Oh, I like both. What's first thing in the morning? Tea. Tea. And then a morning, only one coffee a day, morning coffee. Mm -hmm. well, it's the mug of tea with the beans on sides, isn't it? Yeah. So the... <laughs> well, the mug of tea, yes. <laughs> and scone or scone? Scone. Mm. So if you could only choose one cover to sing, would it be Addicted to Love or Never Can Say Goodbye? Never Can Say Goodbye. That's a tune, oh, I love that, that song. Absolute mm -hmm. tune. That, yeah. Uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. Yeah. Have you, what dog you got? I know you've got a dog. Cockapoo. Oh. Very cute. So if you had a choice, which country would you choose to tour in? Oh, um, Australia. Because I've no, I have never been to Australia yet. Oh. Hmm. Okay. It's a you long have to flight. Write that one down for next year. Then. It is a long flight. That's what puts me off. That's yeah, easy. I've done it. It's awful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing that I don't fancy. Beautiful place. I'd love to live there, but that flight. Yeah, it's too much. <laughs> so, childhood hero. Oh, um, the Beatles. Great one. Yeah. Uh, pineapple. On a pizza, yes or no? Yes. Ooh, well done. Yeah. <laughs> Red sauce or brown sauce? Red. Great stuff. <laughs> Last thing you watched on TV? Uh, Holby City. Records or CDs? CDs. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, what music are you currently listening to at the minute? Oh, what's the last album? Uh, uh, there's a new. Uh, there was a Neil Diamond album, album um, out at Christmas with the London uh, Philharmonic. And right. I'm, I, I, I really like him as a songwriter. I think he writes great mm -hmm. songs. Yeah. And it's, it, if you, I don't know if you like Neil Diamond. Mm -hmm. Don't like everything, but he writes some great songs. But it's, it, it's fantastic. The orchestrations and so that, that's the last thing I listened to. Mm -hmm. Well, look, cheers, Hazel. It, it's been a real absolute joy um, and, and we wish you 
every success and health as well best of health in, in the rest of 21 but before you go could you possibly remind us where we can find out more about you and f any more future performances you want to plug yeah i just go to my website or my facebook but fa uh, website will have all the performances and stuff all right well thank you for listening to stuff and nonsense our guest again was hazel dean singer empress of euro pop and lgbtq Ooh plus ally it would be great if you'd show us some love by leaving us a review you can like subscribe retweet all that other nonsense then you'll miss any of our stuff and nonsenses find us <laughs> find us on the stuff and nonsense show on facebook which is facebook.com forward slash the stuff and nonsense show i get far too tongue-tied that's why i never <laughs> always does that little bit and i have a bit of a list i have a wee bit of a list <laughs> as well so it sounds the stuff and you know <laughs> Yeah, but, th but thanks uh, again, um, Hazel. So goodbye, Anella. All right, goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Bye, Hazel. Hazel. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.